uh, welcoming you all to this webinar and we are delighted to welcome you all on the feast of Bridget, be it that it is the goddess Bridget, the poetess Bridget or Saint Bridget and there are many different variations on this feast day which we will all talk and discuss tonight with you. I am sure you are well familiar with our panellists tonight, Dr. Elva Johnson and Dr. Kelly Fitzgerald. And I am Regina E. Hullatine. I am the chair of Irish in the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore in University College Dublin. I will also give you the details of our panellists in a few minutes. But uh, just to welcome you all and uh, particularly to this eve of Imbolc and when we are all very conscious of this pagan festival uh, which was associated with the pagan goddess Bridget. Um, as we know and in the context of our talk and our panel tonight I think it's very relevant to state uh, the context of this tonight and this is that um, this feast is really about halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox and it is one of the four Gaelic what would be pagan festivals the others being Beltania, Lunasa and Samhain marking particular aspects of the pagan calendar and perhaps now the Christian calendar uh, which we will all discuss tonight but the main topic of conversation tonight is Bridget and Bridget in the context, as we said, of the goddess or the poetess, but also in the context of one of our three patron saints, Colum Kill, Patrick and Bridget. And maybe she had to fight a bit harder to find her way into that uh, list and into the honours. But uh, I think we are finally acknowledging the role of Bridget in the many guises, pre-Christian and Christian and uh, in, in that pagan context as well. Just to note as well, uh, in the context of her name and coming from an Irish language background myself, the Brie uh, actually means power or strength. So it's actually, there's a good foundation with, with this name. And then of course, Brie means a maiden. So there are a few dimensions, but maybe the strongest is the power and the strength which emanates uh, from Bridget as a female figure in our Irish tradition. As I said, our, um, my colleagues tonight uh, will also be dealing with all of these uh, areas. But in truth, Bridget is one of those who is perhaps a little bit more awkward to deal with because she has the local aspect but also a very national and in fact international aspect. She is a complex figure, but perhaps it is that complexity which rekindles our interest in her and makes her an interesting figurehead for us in Ireland in a general context, but particularly I think as we move towards the women of Ireland and what we stand for and how we are represented within society. It is her complexity that in fact makes her versatile and makes her interesting to us in the context of the discussion. So I am going to, I just want to make you aware also tonight that uh, there is a question and, and answer. And I would ask you in the question and answer function uh, to put in your questions. As the chair, I will do my best to keep an eye on the questions that are coming in. And of course, this will be panel session. So while there will be a presentation from uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Fitzgerald, uh, we will also have time for the panel discussion on this. Uh, so please do use the question and answer function on your screen. So to introduce Elva and Kelly. Uh, Elva Johnson is an Associate Professor in the School of History, University College Dublin, where she specialises in early medieval Irish history. She is also the editor of Analecta Hibernica and a member of the Irish Manuscripts Commission. Her current research is in two major areas, Ireland as a frontier of the Roman Empire 
and the interconnections between gender and sanctity. She has published and talked frequently about St. Bridget and other female saints. And tonight, Elva will focus on the early medieval cult of St. Bridget. Kelly is the head of the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore in University College Dublin. She is also the head of the subject area of Irish folklore and ethnology. She is the incoming honorary editor to the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries and is currently the president of the society. Popular and folk religion is a research, a research area that Dr. Fitzgerald has focused on throughout her academic career, particularly its function in oral narrative. Kelly will focus on the folk narrative and the belief of St. Bridget tonight. And I think the combination of what we are having tonight, and I would like to think that perhaps uh, coming from an Irish language background as well here, that we will be able to contribute uh, to an interesting discussion and some new insights on what, thanks to the Lord Mayor of Dublin and her initiative on Bridget, will bring another aspect and an, a, a dynamic side to the inquiry on what Bridget represents for us today, what she represented in the past, and how we can work with that uh, perhaps icon imagery as well to see how this is made relevant for oncoming generations and how this lies within who we are and what we are in Ireland and in a global context. So without further ado, I understand that uh, Kelly and Elva uh, are going to start now on uh, their presentation. And following the presentation, we will be opening up the questions and the Q&A. Please continue to, to put in anything you want to at the moment. But I have and we have um, put some questions together that we would like to explore as part of this panel session tonight also. But we will also be delighted to accept your questions. So I'm going to hand over now to Elva and to Kelly. Uh, th thanks so much for, for that, Regina, and for you know organizing this session and getting myself and uh, Kelly to, together. Um, I'm just going to share a screen with you now. And this is just a few slides, just a few informative slides. Um, that myself and Kelly will be using to structure what we say. Now, obviously we're covering a really vast period of time, um, you know, going from the, you know, fifth century um, up to the present day. As, as Regina already said, Bridget is a highly um, complex figure. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to her and she has been interpreted and reinterpreted um, across centuries of Irish history. And one of the ironies in a way of this is that in the period I'm looking at, which will be sort of the origins of the of, of Bridget, she was arguably the most popular of, of Irish saints, uh, probably more so on a on a sort of a popular level, say, than, than Patrick. Uh, and yet over time, Patrick's Day came to be the, I suppose, the feast day um, most associated with, with Irish identity. Now, what I want to just do with you now pretty briefly, and I'm, I'm really using these points to maybe open discussion a little bit more, is just to talk to you a little bit about um, the sources that we have for Bridget, um, who Bridget was, do we know who she was, how was she portrayed, and then what are the connections between the cult of Bridget and native traditions uh, in, in the Christian past. Um, Bridget is actually one of the best attested of all Irish saints. There is a vast corpus of material associated with Bridget um, from the very beginnings of writing in both Latin in Ireland and in the Irish language in Ireland. So she's a saint who has a multilingual tradition um, really from the very beginning. Now, I'm not going to get all technical with you, but just to give you an idea of the type of sources we have, um, we've biographies of Bridget. Um, in fact, the earliest surviving biography of an Irish saint uh, is one of Bridget. So the biographies of Bridget enter the field before the biographies of Patrick. Um, there's hymns associated with her, uh, poems, a range of stories, 
And also there's the whole material culture foundations associated with Bridget. Obviously the most famous is Kildare, but she's a saint who really had a national profile uh, from the very beginning. Um, and not only did she have a national profile, she actually developed an international profile as well, as, as Regina mentioned. Um, Irish uh, people, when they traveled to uh, Britain and to the continent, uh, they brought their knowledge and their biographies and traditions with them. And there is a very rich manuscript tradition um, concerning Bridget on the continent. Um, in fact, we're looking at hundreds of manuscripts. So she's a really well attested saint um, throughout the Middle Ages. Now, it's one thing the sources that we have for Bridget, it might sound, sound a little bit dry. Um, but who was Bridget? Um, what, what did they, who did they think Bridget was? Okay, so those who were writing about Bridget um, from the mid the seventh century um, believed that she was a younger contemporary of St. Patrick. So uh, they thought that she was born sometime perhaps in the middle of the fifth century and that she died at some point um, in the 520s. There's a bit of debate about exactly when that happened, but this isn't very unusual. I mean, they had lots of questions around the dates associated with Patrick as well. Um, so as somebody who was a younger contemporary of Patrick, she's seen as um, someone who grew up in an Ireland in the midst of a transition from native beliefs uh, to, to Christian beliefs. And Bridget is presented in some of the most important sources we have of her as a bridge between those different belief systems. So whereas Patrick is often presented as being quite antagonistic to native culture. So, and, and, and now this is not the historical Patrick, I, I hasten to add, this is how Patrick was portrayed in the seventh century. He's portrayed as sort of, you know, fighting with Druids quite a lot, defeating them in, in sort of single combats, a bit like something you'd see in a Marvel movie now. Um, while Bridget is seen as somebody who, um, converts those. Uh, so her, for example, her foster father is a druid. She eventually converts him to Christianity. So she's seen as a bridge between the different traditions. And this is very much reflected in her biography. So she's envisaged as having a father who's a nobleman and a mother who's a slave. It's really unusual in a hierarchical society uh, like Ireland. And this origin leads to probably the most attractive, I suppose, aspect of the cult of Bridget in that she's presented as being the patron, the advocate and the protector of those who are powerless within Irish society. It's a really powerful image and one which really runs contrary to a lot of other portrayals of saints where they're very much put in connection with kings, with the powerful, with the elites. With Bridget, she's looking after those who are prisoners. She's looking after people who are poor. So she's seen as having this very protective role as a saint. This partly ties into her gender because the, uh, the fact that Bridget is a woman is obviously very key to her cult. Um, and this cult looks in two different ways. On the one hand, she's celebrated as really the epitome of, of sort of virginal sanctity. And on the other, she's seen as a maternal figure. And at all points, when we look at that cult of Bridget, and it's what makes it so complex, maybe so difficult to approach sometimes, is that she always has one foot in both worlds. She's a foot in the world of sort of popular tradition, um, popular beliefs, and she's a foot in the world of Christianity and its institutions. And Bridget is made up of both of these aspects. They're not in, in her biography, um, in the way she's presented, these are not aspects which are um, at war with each other. These are aspects which you are united um, in the figure of Bridget. Now, this role that she has as sort of the patron, I like to think of it of, of her as being sort of a patron of the powerless, um, is something which carries over, I think, into her biography and into her popularity. We can also see it in the types of miracles associated with Bridget. So, for example, she has the typical miracles you would expect of, of a saint. Um, these are miracles that are based on the miracles of Jesus um, in the New Testament. But she also has miracles which sort of align her with the natural world and with the world of 
agriculture. And as, as Regina mentioned, the 1st of February is not only the feast day of St. Bridget, it's also one of the four quarter days in, in Irish tradition, which undoubtedly go back to the pre-Christian calendars of the Irish Imbolog, which is, as, as people as people will know, is, is a sort of a primarily agricultural festival. So there, there's a lot of different things um, going on in that presentation of Bridget. Now, that's sort of this leads to me to one of the, I suppose, major aspects of modern debates about Bridget and a dichotomy, which I don't think should be a dichotomy, which is, you know, are we looking at a saint or are we looking at a goddess? And sometimes the two are seen as being antithetical to each other, that, you know, there's a, you know, there's a goddess and somehow the saint, you know, takes over from the goddess or makes the goddess less important. Now, this idea of the importance of a, of a goddess, Bridget, was popularized um, by people such as Maud Gone. So, for example, um, she presented the goddess Bridget as being a, a sort of a symbol of Irish women, womanhood. OK, so there's quite a lot going on there. Now, now what is the evidence for uh, for the existence of this goddess Bridget and how does it relate to the saint that I've been talking about. Um, well, there are references in Irish tradition to a, um, a pagan supernatural figure uh, named Bridget. There is a ninth century text known as Cormac's Glossary, um, which is a very famous reference. Well, famous I know is relative, but a famous reference, let's say in my field. And it refers to, to Bridget and says there was a Bridget uh, who was a goddess of healing, of smithcraft, of poetry, like Regina mentioned, and that she was the daughter of the Dagda, um, who is a, um, again, a sort of a supernatural figure, a god within this sort of pre-Christian system of beliefs. And, and the commentator goes on to say um, that Bridget was so powerful that the name Bridget came, became the, the meaning for the word goddess um, in, in general. Um, there are other stray references here and there. So for example, um, Bridget appears in the stories of the Tuha Te Dan and the sort of the fairy folk who are a more or less the descendants again, perhaps, of pre-Christian beliefs. Um, now, does this mean that the Bridget of Kildare that we know is simply um, an avatar, let's say, of this pre-Christian goddess? I, I don't think it does, and I don't think it has to. I think what we can say is that the name Bridget is, is about um, you know, and, and we do see the recycling of, of, of names associated with supernatural figures in Irish tradition. Angus is, you know, is another example. Um, but I do think, and, and I do think that the cult of Bridget generates extra momentum because of that connection between the saint and the native. I don't think it's a coincidence that Bridget as a saint is shown as a bridge between, you know, the new transformative traditions and what had gone before, and you know, in a sense, creating an amalgamation of both elements of those cultures. Um, but the reason that I'd sort of like to emphasize the saint a little bit is because when we look at Saint Bridget, um, we're looking at one of the very rare instant instances that we have in medieval Irish history of a woman who is honored and admired and is seen as on a par with men and in fact superior to most of them. And I think by overwriting the saint with the goddess, we really run the danger of writing out of history one of the most empowering historical female characters that we have. I don't think it's a question of either or, I think it's a question of both. And I think we can look towards those native traditions we can celebrate them, but I think we can also celebrate the fact that we have an empowered female figure who very much runs against the grain of patriarchy in early medieval Irish society. And for me, in all of the complexity of Bridget, and I've really just really scratched the surface on this, um, for me, that empowerment of Bridget as a, as a historical figure, alongside her role as a patron of those who don't have power, alongside this amalgamation of the new and the old is what makes her such an intriguing and fascinating figure. Now, I think I've talked for quite a long time at this stage, and I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Elva, thank you. I could not have had uh, a better 
um, uh, discussion about Bridget before my bit uh, than you. So thank you so much for that. And um, again, I think it's quite interesting. We are in a way almost going over quite a number of years here. As you can see, I've gone very far. I've started with 1972 on the screen here. Um, and uh, uh, in a way, um, the Bridget that Elvis speaks of feels very familiar to me as the ethnologist, as the folklorist. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting aspect of when we look at it. But I also want to almost put a, put a caveat on that as well, in that let's not just kind of project this kind of single tradition since the early medieval into more recent times. And I think that that really doesn't allow us to understand the complexities of Irish culture and where Irish culture has gone. But at the end of the day, then we see so much of what Bridget represents is still so important to just being a human being is what we come across. But I'll come back uh, to that. So, so thank you for that. Now, my work, I tend to look at more uh, for some from the 19th into the 20th century, when we're getting much more kind of ethnographic material uh, from the people. And in a way, from the get go, we need to recognize that the source material for my research would be very different than the examples that that Elva was giving us there. On the one hand, Elva has the records of the people who are writing them. And, on, and in some ways, I always kind of recognize the lack of my knowledge of the of the kind of organized side of religion, because I spent so much time with the people. <laughs> so that's just another thing there. But of course, when we look at Bridget as a, as a folklorist, as an ethnologist, we are needing to put it into the larger context. And as Regina has referred to and Elva did there as well, let's think about this sense of the quarter days. Now the quarter days are definitely have a lot of kind of human uh, projections onto them. But at the end of the day, we are dealing with the seasons. There are some things there that we cannot change. And I hope all of us, I don't know if you um, were up early this morning and had an early walk. Um, I know Elva was planting some chili seeds this morning and had a walk on the Sandy Mount Strand. I had my walk and you are beginning to feel that the light is coming back and the end of winter is near. And I think again, traditionally thinking of this as the first day of spring as a very important sense to understand what's happening into the calendar. And particularly if you are in a much more agricultural society, a society that is engaging uh, with the land in that way, the importance of that. Now, Bridget's day uh, is the only one of the four days of the year that we referred to already that ta has taken on the Christian name. And again, it's quite interesting. Uh, we see that um, perhaps because, of course, the 2nd of February is Candlemas. And so you almost have to um, have an explanation for the 1st of February and what's happening. And here we have our Mary of the Gales, um, the earliest writings of Bridget kind of referring to her in that regard. And we see um, when we look at the, the folk narratives, because so often the folk narratives are giving explanations for the world around them, the kind of folk narratives. And we have to think about the relationship between Bridget and Mary, because so much of what we look at with Bridget, uh, how she fulfills uh, the role in Irish society, uh, that female role that, that, that again, you can see some of that in other ways, and particularly when we look at the devotional revolution and all that, the impact of Mary and Nock and, and all that, but we won't go in there. Her day is tomorrow. It's Bridget's today. Uh, and we see there then this kind of relationship. And I, I, I love this narrative, as Elva knows all too well. Um, and this image that, of course, Mary is getting over having given birth to Jesus, we're just still kind of coming out of that season. Uh, and she is uh, going back to church for the first time since she had given birth. She's being churched. Um, and she's quite kind of embarrassed. She's a bit shy. And Bridget kind of says, Mary, don't worry. I'll distract all the parishioners. I'll distract everyone in the church. And she puts on some kind of fancy dress. And I think if we look at the biddy boy that's on the screen here from Homer Sykes from Kilorgan in 1972, this kind of the aspect of 
that fancy dress. And this is not um, uh, for the Biddy Boys alone. Obviously, we are looking at the kind of winter traditions from Samhain going through the winter and the various kind of masking, mumming traditions that happen in Irish society. And we're really kind of coming to the end of that now here with Bridget's Day. And here she then, she gives her a, a kind of a thing to distract Mary uh, going into the church and that relationship there. And Mary is so kind, thanking Bridget for that. She gives Bridget her day before her own. And, and this kind of folk explanation of that. But if we think of it then again, what do we get from the eve of Bridget's day? You know, the Bratbrija, putting out the Bratbrija and this bit of cloth that traditionally cures headaches, that cures, you know, if you're, you have a leg ache and you put um, her cloak on your knee or wherever it is, it, it, it takes away uh, uh, the pain. And that sense, so much that sense that pastoral care that she gives, uh, the sense of health and well-being. Here we are looking at the spring um, coming right up to 2022 as we are choosing um, or have chosen a bank holiday after coming out of COVID. It is so apt that it is on Bridget's Day. And it is apt for reasons in the 21st century as it was in the 18th century and going back to the early medieval period. So we see here again, the marking of the year is so important. The marking of the year around special foods, about, about um, how we engage with the world, the, the taking in the reeds and making the crosses. This is us as a community, as you know, a community and a very small community. There was, this was very personal. These are families coming together. The celebrations are quite close, they're quite private. Um, the eldest daughter in the family had a very important role on this eve. So this this image of the female. And of course, we can look at that. We can look at St. Lucia Day in Scandinavian countries, and we can compare other festivals that have continued on with the female Christian saints and how they have an impact. Because at the end of the day, traditions will only remain when they have a relevance. And again, um, is it for a bit of fun? Is it a bit of bringing the community together? Is it this kind of marking? We have made it through a really tough time and we're looking forward to the lambing season. We're looking forward to the calving season. Hence, Bridget and her connection uh, with cattle. And it's, I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that we have a female connected to cattle. Let's connect the women to the milking and give us our due for what uh, we have uh, a very large uh, part of. So we see here, particularly this half of the year as we go into it, the animal husbandry, that side of agriculture is preparing. And then the second half of the year, beginning with Lunasa in August, uh, the beginning of the harvest until the end of Samhain. So the year, it's quite tidy in how we look at it. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the particular particularities, if that's a term, is that a word, uh, of Bridget on this day. But then we see how that fits into the, the larger cycle of the year and how these traditions parallel other times of the year and what is happening at that time of the year as well. So when we think of our narratives with her again, that that brought her cloak and that image of the cloak, the woman's cloak as such an important garment for her. And of course, due to, uh, you know, school retellings and various things, of course, the image of her, the Bratbrija covering the Korok and her claiming her land for her for her monastery. Again, that stays very strong into the tradition, uh, this powerful woman uh, having that impact. We have other things of her kind of calling, and again, you invoke her. I think it's quite interesting uh, rethinking of, of Patrick. If we think of Patrick's day and we think of Bridget's day, you know, we might, you know, in the invocation of Patrick may have been, you know, fairly popular, but you don't want to be quite intimate with Patrick. You don't want to really let him know how vulnerable you are feeling. You're not going to like allow Patrick into your kind of interior life to the same extent. You know, he doesn't have, I can't imagine Patrick really caring that much. We could get into a debate about that. Bridget is there. Bridget is there for the underdog. Bridget is there when you are down on your luck 
and she will she will not pass judgment she will be there for you and she will take care of you and this this image you know this folk image of her um having uh you know a man uh, a, a blind man place his head in her lap and he when he comes up he can see again and it's it's very religious um but again in bridget's uh, telling of it and in the folk narratives of it it has a sense of magic of caring uh, that she has with her so again the numerous kinds of ways we can see her and i i guess elva if you could go on to the next one just another image from homer sykes here uh of of this uh image of the biddy boys um the image of course uh looking at the gentleman on the left why i love this that homer took these in 1972 and you see that commercial plastic mask already kind of coming in. And, and so let's not just uh, think of this as kind of stagnant traditions that have never changed. We take on uh, the kind of material culture if it suits, if it is fitting, right? So on the left-hand side, we have that kind of very store-bought scary plastic mask that reminds me of my childhood um, for a much different time of the year. Uh, and then on the right, you have the kind of more traditional, that image, that kind of uh, image of the brijog, the effigies that are carried around by the biddy boys, um, the, the, the effigies that are carried around. And this, this whole sense, there's a real sense that Bridget visits you. You put out your brapija, you put out her cloak in your back garden or in your on your lands the, on the eve. And this sense that she actually her spirit comes across your lands and bless she is physically there for people so the effigy and this effigy image of her being carried around in a perambulatory uh fashion in the community uh gathering things around with her is is just a really important aspect of this day and again that sense of the community and coming together and bringing the community together um with this a bit of joy and a bit of light now we can focus a lot on February, we can focus so much on the courage and power that she has given, and we see it happening at this time of the year. But I suppose I was just going to end then on my final slide here, Elva, please, if you don't mind. And this um, one of the most famous wells, uh, Liz Kanner, uh, Leo Corduff took this image in 1955, and it's one of my favorite. Um, uh, uh, for years, I've, of course, I always focused on the devout uh, attention of the woman in prayer up on the ledge there. But you could see the, the soul of the man down at the well uh, pulling in some water. And to this day, um, this site still is very familiar looking as it is now. But I wanted to draw our attention to the um, early 18th or early 19th century uh, text I have for this well, that on Saturday evening before Garland Sunday, Garland Sunday is not today, I do realize that, uh, that is in uh, end of July, uh, beginning of August, and here we see numbers of people, male and female, assemble at this well and remain there the entire night. They first perform their rounds and then spend a good part of the time invoking the St. Bridget, over the well, repeating their prayers and adorations aloud, holding their conversations with the saint. When this is over, they amuse themselves until morning by dancing and singing. So that coming from the early, uh, uh, from the parochial service, and I think it's it's just, again, the importance to recognize uh, when we say things that in 19th and 20th century Ireland, Irish people were very religious. What does that mean? You know, again, we need to dig further into that because that says nothing to me and i think it really diminishes our understanding of irish culture and irish society and the impact that uh the various um features of the church such as the saint have to offer us um and i just think there is so much for us to dig and explore and discover and uh so thank you very much okay uh, Kelly, August Gurumahigas Elva, uh, plenty of uh, really interesting insights that you brought to a very, very broad life coming right from medieval times to current customs. And, um, you know, maybe somewhere in the middle there, I'm just thinking on, um, you know, Robert Rochford's, uh, the Franciscan on his um, 
modern English version and, uh, of, of her life and how he really speaks of her testimony as opposed to maybe her authority and that maybe, you know, going back to what you were saying, Elva, that, you know, she is presented sometimes as secondary to Patrick and, you know, how can we interpret that today? And then maybe just on, on to tie in maybe what, what, um, what you were talking about, Kelly, in the context of, um, you know, the, the regrowth and the renewal and, you know, you know, at her unveiling or at her veiling, you know, the way the altar became a living green wood at her touch, as, as legend tells us, and how, you know, how we interpret that and linking all of that to her femininity uh, in, in today's. But I, I have, I have, we had, we put together a lot of questions here, and I have taken many notes from what you've said as well, and my own uh, thoughts on this. But we have quite a few questions to get through, and I think in the context of what we um, set out to do tonight, uh, I would like to hand over um, and maybe address some of the questions that our uh, that our audience have put tonight. So I'm going to start um, with. Um, so I know if I can just bring up these questions. Yeah, there's. I'm going to start with the first one, and I hope the guests don't mind. I'm, I'm going to say that they one of uh, Donal. Uh, can the panelists please recommend any reading on the worship? Now there are quite a few questions, and I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to ask you to be as brief as 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 we can be. Although we're we're yeah we're we're coming up to ten past uh, seven. Uh, can, can they recommend any reading on the worship of St. Bridget in Britain in the 5th to 8th centuries AD? And I'm wondering, Elva, maybe have you anything that you could recommend or maybe something maybe that you could come back to and maybe address this with our guest? Yeah, I'm trying to, to uh, a, a good example. I know Laura Cleaver in Trinity has been doing work on the iconography of Bridget in medieval England, for example. Um, I'm not sure how much of that work is, is is sort of publicly available, but I know it's an area of of sort of growing research. Um, so that would be something that would be um, worth looking at. Um, in fact, I do think it's a bit of a gap in the um, in the scholarship that we haven't a lot of works that are really, I think, public facing, maybe showing the diversity of the, the medieval cult and how international it was. So there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, scholarly work um, done in these areas and there's, you know, articles in sort of, well, for us famous, but for most people, quite obscure journals. Um, but in terms of public facing there, I mean, there, there could definitely be more. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's what, you, what you're saying is very relevant, Elvin. I'm just, um, I'm thinking also on um, what, uh, John McCafferty had said about, you know, the lives of Bridget and the other saints becoming available in print, you know, was the literary equivalent to the vast discoveries of bones and early of early Christian martyrs in Rome, which really, I think, you know, he sums it up beautifully in, in the importance of the recording of this, uh, of this material. So I think, Donal, you have tapped into a very relevant uh, area of scholarship, as Elva has said, and uh, something that I think our, our colleagues have, have recognized as well and the importance of it but um thank you elva now i'm going to go on to a question from um yeah yeah so, sorry, could, I, could I just interject really really quickly yeah. here um, just apologies to people if i'm falling in and out of the audio my internet connection is giving me a lot of problems here so if i sort of trail off it's not because i'm not interested in your in your in your questions i've been struggling to get this work um work all evening so just Sorry about that, you know, the limits of technology. Not at all. Thank you, Elva. Um, and, and actually, it's working, it's working well, Elva. It's, it's breaking just now and then, but not to any extent. And I know you've been working so hard to get it uh, up, despite us being in contact all over the world at different points, and you in particular, and you, you've given us so much time tonight, despite the fact that you had many other engagements, both of you, uh, in the context of, of the, the Bridget Fest. So, um, I'm, I'm just going to, Catherine Cronin is our, our uh, second uh, question, and Catherine has has written that she has just finished writing a play featuring Bridget and absolutely loved spending the last year researching and living with her. Uh, so surprised to hear how little we learned about her from school and media. And maybe this goes back to some of the stuff that you touched on, Kelly, when you were talking about the imagery and that and the icon, uh, the iconography, actually, that we've all engaged in through our lives in different pagan and Christian festivals. 
Um, exploring her ancient lore and hagiography was very rewarding. Bridget enriches Irish history and culture in the same way as Greek and Roman figures do their respective cultures, for example. She's like our Hibernian Hestia, and that emboldens her saint self, in my opinion. So for our panel, how would you like to see people or Irish society celebrating and commemorating her in many guises? And I'm really sorry to have to ask you to be brief, but I am conscious that we have until half eight. Now, we're, we're doing OK. So we do have a few minutes, but uh, maybe Kelly, I'll come to you first on this one. How so, would you like to see Irish society and people celebrating and commemorating her in her many guises? Yeah, I, thank you for that. I, I think, um, again, uh, in a very kind of ecumenical sense, I, I think Bridget would feel um, quite upset if she, if she, if we weren't kind of being fully inclusive and embracing. I think it is our time of year to look at those who, you know, aren't as doing uh, as well as others. Um, she definitely would want to look at the underdog. I think she would definitely want to be a champion for that. Um, not in a molly coddle kind of way, but I think she would want strength to come from that. And I, I, I think there's a, a number of her attributes that have remained, have kept her relevance with us throughout the centuries are still there. I don't think we need to make them up, but I don't think we need to go back to something that it didn't really exist either. But, but Elva may want to expand on that. Okay, Elva. Um, we're, we're sort of at one really, Kelly, on this, like, like I suppose many other things as well. I think it's, it's Bridget as, as as the patron of those who don't have power um, within society. You know, it, it's not about it, in, in a way um, when we look at some of the, the other figures from that era, it, it's, it's very much about power relations and dealing with elites and dealing with hierarchy. And, and Bridget does that, too, but she does it on behalf of those who can't. And you know, she's an advocate for for the poor. She's the advocate of the people, you know, who, uh, you know, aren't aren't gaining the profit from their work. And I think that Bridget is is somebody that we 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 can celebrate ourselves through kindness, um, and 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 through thinking of those issues of inequality, you know, that we have in society. Yeah. And I would say could be a moment for us having a conversation around that. Um, rather than just sort of, you know, like with Patrick's Day, it's become in a way a celebration of, of Irishness and in various in various guises. But I think it would be a wonderful opportunity to, to think about inequalities and how do we address them and how do we advocate for them. Thank you, Elva. I might just add a little bit to that. And um, in the context of this initiative from uh, the Lord Mayor as well, in the context of her story, I think um, that, that that's a beautiful concept. And the fact that we all, men, women, and children, we all have a story. And to celebrate a life and a story in the way that it can become accessible to the next generation. And to me, I think that is, you know, commemorating her in many guises is, is to almost humanize what she stood for within her time but that that can also be transported as a relevant aspect for humanity and what concurring with what Kelly and Elva have both said, um, concurring with that for our younger generation when perhaps they are faced with so many challenges today and so many challenges that perhaps over, over generations that maybe were faced in different guises as you have so beautifully put um, in, in your question, Catherine, but um, I think that is what we, you know, to make it relevant in that way today and think in the context of our next generation. So I'm going to move on to Fiona Carey's question now. And can I ask about the symbolic link? So the questions are coming in fast here. So uh, between Bridget's cloak and the womb, I heard uh, from someone, but I haven't been able to find much. So maybe could we could we touch on that? Maybe um, Kelly, I think you touched a little bit on some of that in, in in your talk. So I might ask you to come in on that if that's okay. Well, sure. Um, okay. Um, uh, her, I, I suppose again, the cloak is such the the female um, garment. I you know I, we have a we have a folklore colleague. I believe he's in Cork. I don't know where he's at the moment. Shane. 
he, you know, he sees the the kind of God's eye Bridget Cross, that kind of God's eye image is the vulva. I, I suppose the wanting to draw a kind of um, female image, you know, the, the female imagery and the body and the importance of the body, um, making those connections. I, I don't know if we need, I don't know if we need to make those connections necessarily, but I, I seen people drawing on that. I, I don't know if Elva wanted to add to that. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I mean, the it's it, it, it's actually it's an interesting, interesting suggestion. Um, I would sort of agree with you. I don't I don't know that that's probably what was intended um, with the image originally. Um, I mean, that the cloak is sort of a fairly common sort of garment in Irish society. But I would absolutely agree that um, Bridget's sort of her gender, the idea that, you know, she's a woman, that she's she's a mother, even though she's a virgin, that all of those are exceptionally um, important aspects of her cult. And there is a womb connection in one of the earliest texts that we have about Bridget. Um, and this is um, a life of Bridget, which contains a mini life of Patrick within it, basically. And in this one, one of Patrick's friends, the bishop named Brown, um, uh, there's a, an accusation of paternity made against Brown by, um, by, by a woman, obviously, and um, uh, Patrick calls on Bridget, and uh, Bridget is then able to speak to the uh, fetus in, in the womb, who then points out who the father is, who, who isn't Bishop Brown. But it's an interesting moment because Patrick delegates to Bridget, and turns to her authority in that instance. And it, it you'd almost feel that it's a sort of a gendered form of authority that is Bridget um, because she's a woman, because of her attributes, who is able to do this rather than Patrick. So there, there is definitely, definitely a connection between, you know, Bridget and, and the womb and, and motherhood. I hadn't thought of it. It's a really interesting question. I hadn't thought of it in those terms before. That's given me sort of food for thought, which is always the great thing about these panels, because you, you, you sort of, you know, go, go back and, and you think about all of those um, sort of insights that, that, that people are very generously sharing with us. Yeah, no, really, really interesting insights from both of you, Kelly and Elva, and of course, the you know, going back to the early Irish um, meaning of in bulk, you know, in bulk, you know, uh, in the belly, you know, and maybe, you know, the connotations there of the womb and, you know, even, you know, um, in contemporary terms, maybe, you know, the the, the cloak uh, being the way of um, uh, dealing maybe with the expansion of the womb in, in uh, as, as, as a baby grows within and again going back to the original of regrowth and renewal and that there are certainly um lots of tangents there i suppose that that that, that could be uh linked into that um another can either panelist speak on the idea of bridget as queer icon and her relationship with derluga has anybody uh any Alpha? Yeah, there there has been a bit of bit of de debate about this one. Um, so um, in the um, earliest life we have of Bridget, um, she's described as having a close friendship with with Darlugdoch, who is the next abbess of Kildare. I mean, I, I'll be honest. In the context of the text, I I wouldn't I wouldn't personally um, give it give it a queer reading. I don't think. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that we can't take that sensibility and, and look at how we might interpret it in modern terms. You know, as, as Kelly was saying, um, Bridget isn't a, a static figure, and there is no doubt that within we have about her at an early stage, female friendships are as important to her as male friendships. And you know, again, that that's something that I think is is worth thinking about, and 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 maybe you know, giving giving further thought to. Yeah, and I suppose in the context again of, you know, the society that we live in, that that you know that there are avenues for using um, these discussions to bring out other aspects of our society that we need to be talking about and um, the, the, the relationships that ensue. Um, Kelly, would you like to say anything or you, will I move on to the next question? Yeah. Are we, are no, we that's I would just, again, well? I think, yeah. And I would just agree, I would just agree with Elva. I just, it's that early medieval, I, I so thank you, Elva. Okay, okay, I'm going to, and because there are actually, um, 
there's uh, there are one or two comments and questions in the chat as well so I, I, I am getting to them but I just I'll finish off in the Q&A here the the last one is from Catherine Catherine Cronin and the image this is definitely one for you Kelly the image <laughs> of the biddy boys are really similar to the spring Fasnacht festivals in Europe is there a connection Again, I, 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 now this is kind of out of my, this is, you know, I, I've probably read like 30 books on this, but this is when I become an academic and say, I think this is out of my area. But um, uh, yes, definitely. We are thinking of this, thinking of this time um, coming into the, the almost Lenten season, uh, the season of Carnival is happening across Europe, uh, across, you know, the whole um, preparing ourselves for Lent is um, definitely something that will be in the air before you know it. So I think those connections can be very strong. I would have colleagues such as Aoife Granville in Cork and various others who would probably be a bit more specific, but I would definitely see um, trends across that about what they're doing and how their their appearance and their whole role within society. We can definitely draw parallels there uh, for that. And, and just to kind of this is um, our kind of big last hurrah before, you know, as we're kind of entering into we'll have, you know, we'll have Pancake Tuesday before you know it. <laughs> <laughs> lovely way to finish up that <laughs> lovely and uh, i'm just going to go to the chat now because i know there are a few um messages and uh, again we've lovely warm um messages and this was to be I, I really i want to include the messages and the chat and the q and a and everything because the whole when we were um uh, when we were planning this, uh, when we came together, we agreed that we wanted it to be as interactive as possible. And we, while we wanted to ensure that you, um, that, that we impart as much as we can, we wanted it to become a session where all of us could be involved in the webinar, our, our, our attendees, our participants and our panelists, and that we can all, as, as Elva and, and Kelly have both pointed out, that we can all learn from each other and we can see so many aspects of this already uh, coming up that we could explore. And I'm sure we could spend another hour uh, and maybe if we were in, in, a, in a room doing this or maybe down the line, um, what I would hope is that these wonderful events and wonderful initiatives will cause us to come together as groups to discuss these, maybe just to have a discussion night you know, for an hour and discuss, you know, what this really means to all of us now in, in our contemporary lives, and maybe even more so in the context of what we've all been through over the last two years and how important it is to treasure uh, the history, the tradition and everything uh, that goes way back before uh, pre-Christian and pagan times, as well as putting it in context of contemporary society. So um, we have lovely wishes there for the Imbolc and um, the others. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to go through them now. What significant, uh, if any, uh, does Bridget have to the neo-pagans of Ireland uh, today? Uh, would anybody like to uh, deal with that? Maybe Elva, would you like to come in on that maybe? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't have the expertise, you know, to, to comment about that. But what I, I what I would say is that certainly from the, the early 20th century, uh, and you, you maybe know this better than I would really, Regina, is the extent to which um, she becomes, um, you know, associated with the idea of sort of Irish, Irish womanhood, um, but also pre-Christian Irish womanhood. And from that point of view and you know i'm sort of aware of it sort of on on the margins in terms of of, of how she's been sort of interpreted you know obviously we're reinventing all the time um so 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 that's part of it as well um beyond that i wouldn't really have the qualifications to say but i mean it's 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 it's, it's a really extremely interesting development i don't know kelly from the folk point of view you you yeah. probably have more to say than yeah, I, I suppose it's quite interesting. I, I suppose because when we really start to compare the saint and this kind of goddess image, the attributes that we want to draw on are very, they parallel, you know, so again, does it become a, a, a sense of um, labeling and, and, and that, which is important. I do, I do want to stress that even if some of this behavior looks, you know, some folklorists would want to look at it as if these are kind of neo, you know, pre Christian traits that have remained, you know, and I, I have a difficulty with that. Um, but I do think uh, in the neo-pagan sense, 
they're able to that connection to nature uh, so much that she represents um whether it is her as a saint or the other her other guises um they definitely feel that they can draw on and i think they do i i, I shouldn't be speaking for them I, I am not a practicing neo-pagan but i just from um colleagues and what have you i do know that that today um as a day in their calendar is a very important day for them yeah thanks kelly thanks elva and um yeah i i think i would fully concur with what with, with what you both have said and um that really in the context again it's 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 in that context of maybe recalibrating and uh reassessing um and maybe i mean to use a word that i do research myself in the revivalist context and that to to, to look and see you know where, where does this i mean th this is in the context of neo-pagan pagan religion ever you know there's a mix match here bridget has you know and the study of bridget going right back to medieval times as you have both so eloquently um put forward today and presented you know that it, there are so many dimensions here that we can all take uh something from but i think and without maybe you know focusing on the womanhood aspect of it i think there is certainly uh the the fact of this being and i i, I like actually what this is about tonight in the context of the, you know her story I, I i think you know it's nice to kind of connect into that because that is what we are doing and i suppose again in media research for myself that that is what you know the scale uh going back to the early irish is really uh what 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 a lot of this is about and and passing that on and bringing it through in a contextual and in a realistic way to the next and uh coming generations so um, I just I'll run through these now. Uh, Judy uh, Pem Pomeroy has actually uh, given us the book, The Serpent and the Goddess. Mary Condren had a few chapters on Bridget, so that might help our earlier um, question. And um, we've had a, a lovely uh, reference to the work of her story, again, from uh, Catherine Cronin and praising the work uh, that, that is being done. And uh, Amy Rohu uh, has just been... Uh, very appreciative of the discussion tonight and wondering do we recommend any reading based around this that would be a good beginner option and maybe an easier read and uh, again now maybe I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll revert to um, our panelists um, to Elva and to Kelly if there's anything you know we're, we're talking about a beginner option on how to start off I did mention some of um, uh, John McCafferty's work earlier on the on uh, you know very much uh, a scholarly work and in very um, specific terms, but he has done some very good work also on the overall uh, overview of it. But Elva and Kelly, you are best placed to answer this and maybe you might have some um, references for, you know, for somebody who would like to learn more in an initial capacity. Well, without sort of, I, I, I'm not normally a fan of, of recommending something you've done yourself but in in this case I do have a blog um, on on Bridget sort of covering some of the points that I looked at this evening it's on the UCD libraries uh, cultural um, it's a cultural collections website and so if you just go you know Bridget patron of the powerless you'll actually find it and that is literally meant to be starting at zero Wonderful, Elva, and I'm so glad that you, because I, I was waiting, I was hoping you would say it, and uh, I just said that it was, I, I know there are, there are um, I mean, we have two scholars here who have specialised in all of this work, and um, Elva has written such amazing scholarly work on all of this, but also one of the, the wonderful um, aptitudes of both Kelly and Elva is that ability to be able to acknowledge the starting at the beginning and to bring in the new reader as well as the accomplished and the more um the, the longer reader shall we say uh so thanks for that um elva maybe you might put that into the chat maybe put the the link into it it might be a good idea uh kelly have you have you anything you'd like well, to i guess i mean again it, some of your own work as well well, well i i suppose we have to always Again, uh, uh, folklorists, uh, we, uh, we folklorists here in Ireland, we keep on going back to it. Uh, Kevin Danaher's A Year in Ireland is just kind of the 
introductory text um, I would recommend to everybody. I mean, it is it is um, just brilliant in terms of it. And it's fantastic because it really, Bridget's Day is the first entry in the book. So it's really thinking of the beginning of the year. We're really kind of kicking off properly now, uh, thinking about the year ahead of us. So it is just the, the just such a wonderful time to, to reflect at this moment. Yeah. Great, great. And of course, I mean, we are, um, and I'm not in the context of Bridget, but actually it's something in Irish language we're actually just starting. And believe it or not, we have found that there actually hasn't been an in-depth study of scholar Hachnaman, the Irish women's scholarship in Irish language. So it's something we're embracing in the context of revivalism and that as well. So hopefully there's more of this to come. And we're seeing, I see from Valerie Gibbons here, I think we can say the feminine is rising and needed more than ever. Bridget embodies that. And we have people from the USA, from all over the world coming in tonight. This is absolutely wonderful and um, lovely to see into uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, Kevin Danaher, you've spelt it there, Kelly. And um, the reference for anyone interested, the rights of Bridget, goddess and saint by Shano Ding, uh, and a wonderful collection of folklore rights and information. And that has come in from Rona. And um, we have more from Canada and uh, absolutely lovely messages. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time here and um, I think we are just about coming up to uh, the end of our night and um, we're just three minutes over actually so I'm not going to delay any longer because I know everybody has given us undivided attention. Um, it's been a joy, it's been an absolute joy um, to present this tonight. To, I've really enjoyed the discussion myself and it was just we decided because the three of us have worked together before and we Fortunately, um, our scholarship overlaps and we, we have also related very well in various events and projects that we have worked on. So I hope that you enjoyed this as much as we did it. I want to really thank Elva and Kelly in particular for all the work they put into this tonight and their presentations. And I'm just so privileged to have them as my colleagues. And um, just to thank you all for being available tonight. I note that some people have said that will the recording be posted and it will be it will be posted. Um, I want to thank especially Barbara Neuchrocher. And I'm not sure if you can um, see that the, there is another icon here for the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore, School Miguel Gillian Kelchi Yogas and Villages. And we are so lucky to have uh, Barbara's support and expertise for all of our events. And uh, Barbara will be our, um, it, it, she will make sure that this is uh, made available, but she also brings a wealth of knowledge to every event that we have. And uh, we're so lucky uh, to have her. So, Goramila Mike and Barbara, as the Chod Juanot. So, Gwom Vuyas Liv Erfad, Agas Giam Bamachti Imbolk, Agas Lela Breja, Arav Erfad, Biu Gwalsh Vaganada, Sustachian Tia Sachin, Sunastrail, Suspine, Sunyarup, Etcher Beer Dawn, anywhere that you are tonight. And I hope that you enjoyed this celebration and uh, we will look forward to the next one and maybe in term events. So, Gormila Mahigavacharja, Agas Ikawai.